SpaceX and I suspect it's the same in Tesla. They are in like, you know, this category of few, these like truly extraordinary organizations that live above all the rest. And the ones I try and certainly learn as much as I can from to at least elevate the performance of my own companies. So one of my most favorite things I like to do on this channel is interviewing some of the most innovative and forward thinking individuals of our time. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Jared Isaacman, a successful billionaire entrepreneur, astronaut, pilot, and philanthropist. If you're interested in Tesla, SpaceX, or Elon Musk, you're very aware of the kind of bold and visionary thinking that is required to drive a company's success. Elon's greatest success, I might argue, beyond the products, is the companies that he has created. It's the culture, the employees, and the systems that he has revolutionized. That's what matters most. And you'll find that Jared Isaacman is cut from that same cloth. Jared is the CEO of Shift4, a payment processing company that he founded as a 16-year-old in 1999. The company processes over $200 billion of payments each year for over 200,000 businesses in a variety of industries. Just clearly a home run and a massive success story. They have 30% share of restaurants, 40% share of hotels, but also sports arenas, e-commerce, mobile, you name it. If you've been to Applebee's, Hilton Hyatt, or used Time Magazine, Microsoft, oh, you've used Shift4. Shift4 also partners with SpaceX and Starlink, the provider of satellite internet access to over 53 countries and counting. In 2021, he made headlines as the commander of the SpaceX Inspiration4 mission. It was the first all-civilian crew to be launched into space for a three-day journey around Earth's orbit and raising over $250 million and outsized awareness for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Jared recently announced his plans to fly to space again, which will be the first in a series of three human spaceflight missions called the Polaris Program. So whether you're a fan of cutting edge technology, business innovation, or simply a story of perseverance and achievement, you'll no doubt find this conversation with Jared Eisenman inspiring. Welcome, Jared. It's an absolute honor to be able to have this chance to talk to you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. No, absolutely. Thanks for having me. So as one of the few who's gotten closest to the sun, Jared, I think you're going to be able to get me and my audience brighter. Let's do this. Okay, Jared, thank you again. And I tell you that I, I do need to tell the folks about the story of how we met and how you agreed to do this interview. I think it was quite, uh, quite a fun story. So uh, I was visiting my daughter uh, who works at Manhattan in New York about a couple of months ago. My family and I went there and we visited and watched a couple uh, uh, Broadway shows. And so while we were at uh, Wicked, my daughter, at the very last minute, the show was absolutely about to start already. She wants to go to the concession stand, so we go there. But because it was ending, uh, you, your family and my family were the last people there. <laughs> and as soon as you were leaving, I just yelled out, Jared, <laughs> you turned around and uh, you, you know, a crazy fan talking to you. Uh, really appreciate you to agreeing to do this interview. I mean, honestly, it's like a fan coming up to you, which is weird. But I have to say, too, I was so, so impressed with your wife. Uh, right when you guys were leaving, she turned around and waved. And I just thought that that was very classy. And uh, thank you so much, Jared. I just love that this is how it all turned out. And you agreed to do this. And thank you. No, absolutely. And um, it was great to connect. And um, yeah, it was a good time to be in New York. And um, it, it seems like we were both doing the exact same thing, which is a couple back-to-back -back plays to um, spend some good time with the family. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. It was so much fun. Um, thank you very much again. But this is a surreal opportunity for me to talk to you. Um, I am a startup founder myself, and so whenever I get a chance to talk to folks like you and hear your story and tell us kind of your advice and how you think things have happened, it's always a great thing. And so, I, you know, the first question I like to ask you is, is what makes a great company, right? Um, I believe that uh, SpaceX and Tesla, of which there's a variety of ways that you and Shift4 are connected to that. And uh, so you have kind of like a closer view of both SpaceX, but also your own company, Shift4. So, you know, just tell me a bit more about leadership, um, entrepreneurship, the culture, what made SpaceX different? What made your company different? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So, I mean, what, what makes like a good successful company is, is starting with, you know, opportunity and then a business model to support that opportunity. And I know that seems, you know, like a relatively, you know, simple statement, but I mean, most businesses fail in, in their first year 
And the reason why is, is they weren't really fixing a problem or improving on a problem sufficient, um, you know, to, to support a business model. Um, if you have good opportunity, a, a solid business model behind it, and then, you know, I'd say good, you know, expense discipline, um, you know, and, and a willingness to learn and, and constantly challenge your own thinking, good self-reflection, you, you can probably create a, a great company. Now, you happen to follow some, you know, extraordinary companies, like in a completely different level. Um, and that's where I put organizations like SpaceX and Tesla. Now, they have all of the same qualities we just talked about, which is opportunity. It's They're pretty obvious ones when you think about it, right? Like at some point or another, we were going to have vehicles that that weren't dependent on on, on fossil fuels. Like to me, like electric vehicles were, were inevitable and, and certainly organizations had tried to make them in the past and they, they weren't great products. Right. Um, in the case of SpaceX, you know, pretty much every, you know, orbital launch from the United States was a, was, was essentially a monopoly from a, a joint venture of Boeing and Lockheed. And there's nothing about that that screams efficient or cost effective. Right. So in both those organizations, you have opportunity right from the get go. Then it comes with a business model that 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 obviously in both cases is proven to be quite well. You've got expertise and management, but but they have something more than that, which puts them above the 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 kind of you know great company level to the extraordinary, which is you know a a a, a vision and a mission that is unmatched. Um, and as a result, they attract talent, um, the best talent in the world. I mean, every organization usually has, or most organizations, some degree of A players, B players, C players. You know, Steve Jobs has talked about this. At least at SpaceX, where I've become very close over the last three years, it's nothing but A players because these are people that believe they can't make a bigger difference in the world than than showing up every day at, at SpaceX. And I suspect it's the same at Tesla. And that's why they are in like, you know, this category of few. These like truly extraordinary organizations that live above all the rest and and ones I try and certainly learn as much as I can from to at least elevate the performance of my own companies. Yeah. So you talked about uh, product and the mission and the great employees, but there must be more to that, right? Because I, I believe pretty strongly that if you look at uh, Tesla and your own company, what you guys have done, it's actually the company that is the product. And so how do you design the company beyond just the things you've mentioned that made it, that makes it so innovative, right? You guys, your shift forward, well, I'll, I'll ask you more questions about that, but you guys are just expanding like crazy to way beyond what you initially started with, to different um, segments of industry, to going global. Um, but it's just, it's beyond that, right? It's not just uh, start with a great product, start with a great business need. There is something about the way you've set up your companies, <laughs> and I want to dig in and find out what is it. What did you guys do? Yeah, but I think just to to push back a little bit on that, right? Like I think Shift Four is a great company. Like we built yeah. a great business, and, and and we should strive every day to be an extraordinary business. Um, but SpaceX and Tesla are in a different league of their own, and and the reason yeah. I say that, right, is like um, we we can attract some some fantastic talent at Shift Four. Um, and they can believe in our, our vision and mission, but I don't know if like, you know, powering, you know, the world through connected commerce, for example, is something that you can say, like, I want to do this for the rest of my life because <laughs> there, there's no way I can make a bigger impact in the world. Right. Um, yeah. like there are, there are like sound business models in fast food, right? Like people want to be able to eat quick. They want it to taste good. And like, you can, you can structure a model there with good margin and, and it'd be profitable. But like it will never be an extraordinary business because no one's ever going to show up there to make a burger and say, I'm literally changing the face of the world. Um, but like SpaceX is a great example of that. Uh, Tesla is a great example of that where they do attract talent in a workforce that believes there's no other place they can make a bigger impact. And, and by the way, it's not just those two that I'm, you know, had good exposure to. I spend a lot of time with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Mm -hmm. And similarly, they attract the best researchers from all over the world, the best doctors and scientists, because they believe that there is no other place in the world they can make as big of an impact. And as a result, they've done incredible things like improve childhood cancer survival rates from like 40% to you know over 80% based on certain types of leukemia. So I say this like, look, there's a lot of bad businesses in the world. There's a lot of average businesses. There's plenty of failed mm -hmm. businesses. There's some great businesses. And I, and I put shift for in my companies in, in that camp. But there are a couple like truly special ones where they have all the right ingredients to really change the world. Um, you know, and, and, and Tesla and SpaceX are, are, are certainly in that camp. 
Awesome. Wonderful. I appreciate your <laughs> your modesty, but uh, you've done incredible things. So tell us your story, um, your entrepreneurship. I know that you were a 16 year old or 1999. You started several companies before it turned into Shift 4 and you started to, but it sounded like you were very much uh, a just self driven. The company kind of grew on its own and without outside funding until you then started bought uh, several companies together. So that just alone, <laughs> what must that have been like as a, as a teenager deciding that, that decision to just continue with the company, which I, I myself would have done, by the way. That's how I'm wired, but certainly most people are not. So <laughs> that's why I'm interested in hearing more. Yeah, well, I guess my quick, my, I'll try and make it a quick story, but um, uh, I was raised to be very uh, independent. If you, if you want something in life, you, you got to go out and, and work to get it. And um, and maybe that's because I have, you know, my, my older siblings are 15 years, 12 years and eight years wow. older than me. And, um, so when I was, uh, 15, I, uh, started basically like your garage computer repair business. And, um, oh, we were, oh. we were just doing like website designs and building computers. This was in like 1998, I guess. And, um, and then I got a job at comp USA, which is like a computer retailer. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea was just to poach clients. Like, if you couldn't, if I couldn't sell you something to fix your problem, I was creating mm -hmm. a leak for my, my little home computer repair business. And it so happened a credit card company came in. So this is like, by the way, how yeah. luck in life is so important. Like, you know, you, you can, you know, a lot of people talk about, they make their own luck. Look, sometimes just straight up luck is really, really beneficial. And, um, this computer, this uh, payments company came in, uh, it was called MSI and they were, um, they had like viruses on their network. They had a lot of issues. So I was like, perfect, created a lead, went there um, and for my little basement startup. And, um, and we fixed their problem and they, uh, they offered me a job. And uh, I was like, great, I hate high school. This is perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I uh, convinced my parents to let me leave uh, at 16, get a GED. And then um, in about six months, I kind of learned the basics uh, of the payments industry. But most importantly, I figured out where the opportunity was that um, all of the money and innovation was going into putting credit cards in people's wallets so they could, so they could spend, um, and, uh, and not so much on the acceptance side, you know, one was looked at as a trillion dollar industry and the other is just a billion dollar industry. Um, so we set out for on a journey to, you know, really improve, uh, you know, the industry, create a lot of operational efficiencies, scale up distribution, um, and it, it's become an awesome journey since, I mean, um, you know, we we were entirely self-funded. Um, like we were profitable within the first three years of business and, and grew through our own cash flows uh, until about 14 years later when we did our first acquisition and took on some outside capital, which, you know, set us on a course to be the public company we are today. So, um, yeah, incredible journey. It was very, very lucky to be on it. I love that story. But it's, it's shocking, <laughs> shocking that you left high school and it wasn't, you know, I thought it was because you started a business, but it wasn't. You just you had a job. Um, yeah. But as you move forward with this, obviously you you had no experience in payment processing. You noticed that it was a good opportunity, so you start doing it. But what, did you apply any kind of just? Was it just simply I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna learn everything I can, and you're stumbling stumbling along, or did you do any kind of first principle thinking like Elon's talking about? That kind of you sat back, thought about it. Why is it done this way? And because of your high school, you know, <laughs> naivete, whatever the word is, you said, why isn't it done this way? And you just just went ahead. Is that something like that? Well, I certainly didn't know of uh, first principle thinking until after you know yeah. hearing Elon talk about it. But I would say a lot of what I tried to apply at the time does um, does fall within that. Like, let's get down to the basics and understand things, especially like um, finance. Credit card industry is by design to be very complicated, um, and uh, so like trying to cut through all the the mystique and actually get to, to like the foundational elements of what makes it work certainly helped drive a lot of our growth early on. Um, and I'd say like, you know, where you made up for a lack of experience first, I had great mentors. Um, you mm. know, my father, you know, is career, career salesperson, a, a, a true diplomat, um, you know, teaches you a lot about, um, you know, how to work with people and motivate people, uh, and get things done. And then my other mentor was like the first boss of that that company I was working at um, when mm -hmm. I left high school, who is much more of the the hard ass, uh, 
not uh, not a lot of yeah. you know um, advanced education, but um, a lot of street smarts um, on you know kind of how the world can really work at times, um, and to be a proper skeptic at times. And and I've kind of took a blend of a blend approach there. And then I also like obsessed over virtually every decision I made, and I continue mm-hmm. to do that today. Like I will mm-hmm. go back and read emails from 15 years ago to yeah. see what my thought process was around the decision then and, and how it would change now and how to improve upon it. And I, I never stopped doing that, um, even from the early days. So like, you know, basically creating my own like super fast feedback loop um, to just improve, um, you know, and, and be a better leader. Um, so that, that is fascinating. I'd love to unpack that just a little bit. So you go and think about your decision-making process. You actually even review past decisions and you look at how you've done it. So you, you must have a, um, a logical approach that you've did to a system, or is it just, you know, like, did you usually just do it by gut and then you realize maybe that some of that wasn't working well and then you've, yeah, tell me what you're doing there. No, I think like even in, even, even in the beginning, like I said, I may not have known it as, you know, a first principles yeah. approach, but, but tried to bring things down to the basics, see, you know, if, as many angles as I could make the best decision I could. Um, and, and what I've found by the way, over time, like certainly, you know, you gain a lot of experience and, and improve. Um, but like I, I, I generally would arrive at a lot of the same, uh, a lot of the same decisions. I just mm-hmm. use different methods now today, um, than I, than I might've done back then. Are you teaching that in your own company today? Do you do you have you created a culture? Was it uh, conscious of how you the culture of your company and how you structure the organization? I, I would say like our culture has changed quite a bit, to be uh, very honest, since um, since my exposure to SpaceX, actually. Yeah. So, um, yeah. you know how we did things in the past. Um, you know, were um, let's see. I think we we tried to um, we tried to put really good uh, guardrails in place so that others could move very quickly, and you know a lot of the spa- a lot of the principles that are followed at SpaceX um, are much more around uh, individual empowerment, ownership, creating their own rails to move very fast, and then mm-hmm. you know, owning their mistakes, which are fine. Um, as long as you learn from them and having good individual feedback loops for their own self-improvement, the, the it, there are definitely different, I would say sig- significant differences between like the approach that we, and the philosophies we take for our first, uh, 20 years in business than the last three years since I've been exposed to SpaceX. So, wow. Um, mm-hmm. it, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I actually always thought, I mean, I thought that was like, one of my obligations as a, as a CEO at, uh, you know, to be on this incredible journey with SpaceX to try and learn as much as I could about what has made them what I think is the most extraordinary and innovative organization in the world and bring a little bit of that flavor back to, to shift four. So we call it the shift four way, but, uh, a lot of it is kind of, uh, how, how I've seen people operate at SpaceX. I love it. I mean, so it sounds like the theme here is that, uh, you are willing to learn you're willing to change, and that's what you've done all your life. And now you're bringing back the principles. You know, whenever I interview people that have worked at Tesla or SpaceX, what they've said is that it's the rate of innovation that is really unparalleled. And the rest kind of uh, it, it takes care of itself. But if you're a company that can innovate, that, that you just said, self-feedback loops, the willingness to try things, Failure is an option is one of his uh, Elon's favorite quotes that he's repeated a few times. But uh, let's talk a little bit about um, you know SpaceX and and Starlink. So Shift Four is a payment provider for Starlink. It's now global. Uh, how does that work, and where do you see the future of that? Yeah. So we've uh, we've endeavored to go global for a very long yeah. time, it's been one of our goals. It is super hard. Um, yeah. The uh, I don't think people like really know or appreciate Visa and MasterCard was a nonprofit organization up until like the mid 2000s. Um, like we think of it now as these like incredible public companies, right? They were a nonprofit association, like a, like a trade association and their members were banks. That's why even today they're still referred to as their the member banks, at least in like kind of industry parlance. Um, 
So it was designed from the get-go, like any other good association, where everybody kind of adheres to the same kind of organizational uh, structure, bylaws, um, and and that was especially applicable for international. I mean, think about it. You couldn't have one bank do it all. You know, if you have this bank in California that issues you a Visa card, you have to be able to travel to New York or Texas or or the UK or Ireland to be able to buy something with it. And somehow all the money works out where the restaurant over in Ireland gets their funds, you know, and you pay your local bank. And the way they did it is this association created a network of all these banks to move these funds around. Now, you know, why would you, if you were a small bank in, in, in the UK or Germany, sign up for this association, if a bank of America or JP Morgan Chase could just come into your backyard and, and, and gobble up all your business. You wouldn't do it. So it was designed on purpose that like banks within each country have to, have to authorize, settle their funds there. Um, so that makes it very hard. There isn't a bank of the world for payments. Um, so mm. what you basically have to do is go when you expand internationally is, is set up relationships with all these banks and then network them together and create like a uh, a layer in between all of that spaghetti and your customer to make life easy. So, so that's very hard to do. And that's why very few payment companies, I mean, other than like Adyen and Stripe, th those are really the only two examples of true global payment players. And they basically are enduring the spaghetti of relationships all over the world. So anyway, we needed a good reason to, to make this mm -hmm. leap and go on this, in, this global commerce journey we're on. Um, now we had a, you could argue we had a lot of reasons when you have 40% of the hotels in this country. And mm -hmm. a lot of those hotels happen to have locations all over the world. Um, but it still was a risky endeavor. And, and I think the relationship with SpaceX and, and Starlink, which we, we, we try not to, you know, talk too much about, um, you know, became kind of the, the final, uh, catalyst, if you will, to embark on this journey. And now we are processing payments across the EU. Uh, but that's not enough. Um, if you want to be on the stage of like a true global commerce player like Addy and Stripe, you need to be virtually everywhere. Um, you know, Central and South America, Asia Pacific region, Africa. So I'd say we're still early on the journey, but we're excited to have a unbelievable partner and customer um, that we can follow all over the world. And when we do, everything else that made us successful in the U.S. for the last 23 years, we're going to bring into those markets. I mean, We've grown revenue year over year, every year for 23 consecutive years, even through every downturn. Um, the U.S. is an incredibly competitive market for the verticals we serve, which are restaurants, hotels, theme parks, e-commerce. Um, and we've been able to win in this environment. So if we can win here, we can win in other geographic areas, too. Um, and we're following a great customer to get us there. So that's kind of the story. That is fun. I love it. That's uh You've already shared so many things that I'm learning about. Can we? Uh, can I be the first person you, when you're in space to create the first commerce transaction with you? <laughs> can we set well, that up? I can't make any promises because I might. I've been giving some thought to this for a while now. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll throw it out there, but uh, you're 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 balancing so many things. I do want to continue talking to you about Starlink and SpaceX. Uh, but just a quick aside, I saw that you went to the Philippines and you gave away Starlink uh, to the hospitals there. I'm originally from the Philippines, and so I was touched by that, that uh, you do so much philanthropy. That was one thing that you did, but, you know, it's, it's related to Starlink. So tell me a little bit about uh, why you did that and this the need for Starlink, and and then the, how, and then let's, let's dive a little bit closer to how does the payment processing work? Yeah, well, I mean, I, as I mentioned before, I know I'm very, very lucky in life. I mean, some people yeah. get dealt uh, a completely shitty hand um, no fault of their own gets set up, not for success, um, but for, um, some, some terrible circumstances. So ever since, um, like even before I had a company, even as a child, I tried to raise funds for others that were just less fortunate. And as soon as I had a company, then it was always a component of the shift for story. And, um, so we've been giving for a long time now, um, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, yes. the Make-A-Wish Foundation, others, and any of these like cool adventures that I've been lucky to be part of in my life. I've tried to make it about something bigger than, bigger than the person, bigger than even the mission, um, you know, to a bigger vision. And, um, so when I did world record flights, it was to raise money for make a wish foundation. Well, when inspiration four came around the mm -hmm. opportunity to the, the first all civilian mission to space, I mean, the first time it wasn't a world superpower to go up. It was like, this has to be about something yeah. bigger. And we have to show the world that like space is not just for, 
you know, uh, like the wealthy and that we can disregard all of the the hardships and challenges we have here on earth, but we can do both. We can build a better future for tomorrow, but we can take care of problems we have here today. And, um, and that's why, you know, we, we tried to raise uh, a ton of money and awareness for St. Jude. In the end, we raised over a quarter of a billion and, you know, a large portion of it came from Elon. Uh, I made a and large you. portion, but a large <laughs> part from just a lot of people out there that maybe never even knew about the, yeah. the St. Jude story. Well, anyway, the, when Polaris program launched, um, which is really now that we've kind of opened the door with with Inspiration Core, is now build. You know, it's a development program to kind of, you know, build the you know the key steps that are needed uh, in order to really open up space for the many. Um, and the idea was, okay, our work is not done for St. Jude, but like, how do we weave in some of these technologies that you know on the surface, um, you know. Are important for for space flight, like Starlink. I mean, Starlink for sure is connecting a lot of people around the world, but it's how we're going to talk to starships on the moon and how we're going to communicate to Mars someday and show them how that can fit into a story like St. Jude. And that's where telemedicine comes in. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the the reality is like St. Jude has done extraordinary work in the U.S. to elevate the um, childhood cancer wow. survival rates, but the number one factor in childhood cancer survival is where you're born in the world, and that sucks. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, in the Philippines, for example, and, uh, it's still 40%, uh, we've more than doubled that rate here in the U S. So you have basically children in the world that don't even know they need the help of a St. Jude, Well, we can't put St. Jude doctors all over the world, but, but we can put connectivity like Starlinks in all over the world. Um, and then they can find out from a, a St. Jude doc or St. Jude trained doc, like doc may in the Philippines, um, how, you know, what the diagnosis is and then get, get treatment that we know works here in the U S over to those parts of the world. Um, so that, that's just one example, but I, I think like people probably don't even really appreciate how Starlink can like fundamentally try and tackle many of the world's greatest problems just by bringing people access to information and, and, and bridging connectivity gaps that, you know, were previously, you know, very challenging to solve for. Right. Oh my gosh. You just, <laughs> there's like go in every direction here. Uh, so exciting that, but, uh, yeah, you're, you're, uh, your philanthropy was very touching. The inspiration four was very inspiring. Though it it hit uh, hit all the you know the correct uh, goal to give awareness to St. Jude's, and then the funding I I donated as well, and I uh, hope others have were inspired as well. Great, I love the way that you've you know brought that together, and then uh, so uh, just to wrap this up a little bit of the how does the payments work. And with Starlink and when they go to mobile. So this allows any person at any part of the world and even space, like you just said, to be able to access the internet, but also to, you know, basically, you know, communicate and, um, and, and then, so they have to pay for it and then they can buy anything, access any products or services they need. Right. So how does that work? Is it as simple as, I don't know, I have no idea. I'm not going to put words on your mouth. So it, does, it sounds like a very different process than just global, uh, you know, banks. Like you said, how difficult it is by country. How does it work when it's, you know, it's satellites? Well, look, I mean, it, it, in the end, it's a subscription payment and you're buying a, an antenna no different than, you know, buying a cell phone and paying your your, your okay. subscription fee. I'd say where the difference is, is not everybody in the world pays with Visa and MasterCard. Um, you know, here in the U.S., for sure, a very high percentage um, you know, if you go into Central and South America, it's a world dominated by like what we call alternative payment methods. It's like anything mm-hmm. other than cash and Visa and MasterCard. And geez, there's probably, I don't know, 20, 30 dominant APMs in, in Central and South America. There's, you know, at least a dozen or so in Africa, a dozen or so in, uh, in Asia Pacific region. Europe even has a bunch of APMs. In the US, we we're, we're shockingly have like no APMs. I think the closest you could come is maybe calling PayPal an APM, but it, it actually largely r- rides uh, traditional rails like Visa, MasterCard, and ACH. Um, so like uh, we're, we're obviously only have been in the US up until this last year. So, um, you know, where we could fit a need for, you know, an important strategic customer, like you mentioned, it would initially begin in the US. And then now we have capabilities in Europe. Um, but our goal is certainly to, to follow them all over the world and they aspire to be virtually everywhere. And then, like I said, bring in, uh, all the other products and services into those markets that we've been dying to do for a long time. Like there's hotels all over the world, there's restaurants, people got to eat. Um, but our products have been limited to the U S market. Um, and we've done pretty well. So it's pretty exciting to think about what the potential is when you can, you can take those capabilities into new markets. 
Okay, let's go back to the beginning again. So let's, uh, you started uh, your this company when you're in high school. Um, then I heard that, well, I don't know how many years later, you bought three companies. Um, and then when did it become Shift4? When you bought those three companies or how did that happen? Yeah, uh, so, so uh, our journey was um, a company who started in 1999. It was called United Bank Card. Um, right. It's the same like Topco the whole way. So uh, I, it's just the, the priorities changed. In 1999, when you're 16 years old and you're afraid to come out of the basement because you don't want to meet somebody and, and realize. <laughs> really? So it's, you know what's a good name? United Bank Card. That sounds like it's been around forever, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. but like then times change where actually the, the value that we provide in our service is less and less about giving an approval or a decline and spitting out a receipt. It, it becomes an entire commerce experience. Now you're building software where, you know, you can run, you know, the entire, uh, like operations of a business, like a restaurant or a hotel or a stadium. And, and you no longer want this name that sounds like it's been around for a hundred years. So when we acquired, uh, one of the, uh, payment gateways in 2017, which was called shift Four. Uh, we took the name, mm. and um, and and obviously that's been our brand uh, ever since. So, gotcha. Okay. And then today, like you said, thirty percent of restaurants, forty percent of hotels. You've just blown up in the uh, in the stadiums. Every, almost every stadium, right, or most many hundreds that you're in. Uh, all of Vegas casinos. Uh, what is your what's your? I mean, it's just yeah. There's you're you're everywhere at this point, right? And you're headed towards mobile. What? Tell me what your your current uh, strategy is and where you're headed. A little bit more about Shift Four. Yeah, I mean, our number one capital allocation priority is expanding internationally. So, um, again, you know, 23 years of being entirely in the U.S., all of our volume, all of our revenue in the U.S., and growing at like a wicked pace for a long time. Um, yeah. Now think about it when you can expand the addressable market into the rest of the world. But it's hard uh, for all the reasons we talked about before. So it's great to have like a, you know, again, a signature customer that knows that you're on this kind of journey with them and is patient and tells you what the things they like about their current provider in, you know, this part of the world or things they'd love you to improve upon. Um, so that's like the number one thing I'm most excited about is, uh, is our international expansion plan. Outside of that, like we're still taking tons of share in restaurants and hotels and stadiums. Um, you know, we were very, very early to uh, what's called integrated payments now. So mm -hmm. I kind of mentioned this before. My early days, 1999, 2000, it was all about just helping the pizza shop, you know, accept payments. And, uh, and it was very easy for us to improve on that experience because, like, if a pizza shop wanted to accept payments in 1999, it was not a square, frictionless process. Like, it was as much paperwork as a commercial mortgage. So it was easy for us to fix a lot of that stuff. But then we realized really early on, like if you're just in the acceptance game, like you're going downhill really, really quick. Like it'll, this whole thing will be commoditized and, you know, you'll have tons of take rate pressure, margin pressure. So it was like, you need to evolve into, um, you know, more of a, like a full commerce experience, add value beyond just an approval or decline. Like I said, the whole software to run the business, the loyalty program, the online ordering, the business intelligence, right? Um, so that kind of, which is what we call now integrated payments, when you combine payments and software, that's still early days. Like we have a lot of share, but there's plenty of these old legacy, you know, uh, companies that can shed more share. So there's still a lot of work for us to do here in the U.S. But uh, I'm definitely most excited about our international expansion strategy. Gotcha. Where do you see the future? Where is this going to go? So you've obviously gone into international. You got your mobile. It's uh, you're even more integrated. Um, what 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 is the future of payments? I mean, I, I, you, I, you guys are making moves with crypto. Yeah, what what do you see? What are the what are the ways to innovate here? Yeah, I, I I think like from our perspective, like the number one priority is make it easy to do business all over the world, and that's a yeah. that has never been easy uh, at all until rather recently. Um, and like I said, like only Adyen and Stripe uh, really have the capabilities to do that, and 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 obviously they're growing really really fast, and they still have a very small percentage of the overall commerce market. So so our we endeavor to absolutely be on that that stage, and we can differentiate in a little bit in that uh, our roots actually come from uh, like in venue experiences, restaurants, hotels, bars, stadiums. Their roots come from e-commerce, so they certainly aspire to be like us in in venues, and we aspire to have some of their capabilities in the. In, in you know greater uh, e-commerce capabilities and and uh, and obviously greater global coverage. So from our perspective, like you know th the future is that you know you will have businesses that can you know 
uh, basically take payments and interact with customers all over the world. And right now, that's only like Netflix, Amazon, Apple, right. Uber, DoorDash, like only the biggest companies can do that. You know, if you create like a relatively, you know, small business and want to sell your widget or whatnot to a, a consumer in Germany, that's a nightmare. It's probably almost assuredly fraud. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. uh, versus like making that an, an easy process. So we talk about like where you can move the needle. Tam, the, a TAM expansion of, of the world is a huge needle mover, um, but we have to make that very easy and frictionless for our customers. So that, that's, that's where the priority is. Now, like in terms of like alternative payment methods, I really don't care. It's whatever like a consumer is comfortable with and businesses mm -hmm. want to accept as a form of payment. So in parts of the, like what we believe is the right way to do business here in the US is not the right way to do business in Africa or Central and South America. If crypto becomes a dominant form of payment in a certain market, our rails are going to support it. If they want to stick with something that works really well, like Visa and MasterCard or a government, you know, peer to peer funding method, we can support those rails too. Yeah. I love the, the I love the way that you're not just focused on the very large, the biggest biggest companies, but you will demo, democratize this and offer it to the small businesses and let them have the powers that everyone else has. Sure. Um, that's a great mission. <laughs> that's a great mission. Um, any any thoughts? Let's just brainstorm a little bit. You know, as Elon and as bought Twitter just brought in a brand new CEO, but still have plans to make this the everything app, the x.com app. Uh, they just recently purchased a, I said, what is it, a job uh, career site. Actually, I actually don't know what it is, but I think it's a, a job career. Um, but, you know, the, clearly one of the things he's talked about is making it into a financial transaction platform people can buy. It. Any thoughts on how he should do that? Any advice on, on what, how that might work out? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like Elon knows what he's doing. Um, his, his, <laughs> not only does he have, you know, uh, you yes, know, PayPal. Twenty, yeah, tw 20, 25 plus years of extensive business experience and lessons learned to be to refine his method. He he was there early days with PayPal. He knows payments. Yeah. He even more so. He knows peer to peer payments, which was what PayPal really was oh, from the get go. That that's yeah. what's going to be important. Um, you know, with Twitter, like from my perspective, if obviously if anything that, you know, shift four can do to be helpful, but we're really in two different ends of the spectrum, right? Like I want to make it so it's very easy for you to go into a restaurant and order a steak, pay, you know, QR code on your way out. So you don't have to wait for the waiter. Or if you're in a stadium, order a burger and a beer in your seat or, right. or make a wager on the game. That's very different than like, if you create content on Twitter, um, and, and you should be rewarded for it, right? People should, whether it's like donations or accessing premium content, things like, He's doing very, very early steps of with like the subscriber capability that he put into Twitter already. It's a it's a different uh, discipline. It's um, it's uh, it's much more akin to like Square, uh, you know, Cash App, um, Venmo, PayPal, um, and and one I'm very sure he's gonna he's gonna execute on uh, quite well. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> I you just mentioned something that triggered uh, my biggest pet peeve. By the way, is whenever I go to a restaurant, I don't like the credit card dance. So if you could just solve that, and I know that there's some that's it's slowly coming, but boy, I just it's, love it's, it to just pay. It's solved. <laughs> we solved this back in 2014. We were a um, it's just adoption. A, yeah, we were a pre Apple Pay launch provider, and I was like, I hate waiting. Uh, yes. Why can't I just when they bring the check, just pay and leave? So we did QR code payments like eight, nine years ago. Okay. Um, and then obviously they got a big pickup during, uh, during COVID. COVID. I think in some cases it went too far, like not having a physical menu and now you got to try and zoom yes. in the phone. Agreed. That was like, you did. Um, but the whole, yeah. I got my check, I QR pay, I Apple pay it, <laughs> leave a tip and just walk out the door. <laughs> we got it. We, we've had it for a while. We just need more people that want to do it. <laughs> well, for me, I have, but that's, that's a good mission for me too. Okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Elon uh, started PayPal. He knows everything. And he left PayPal or they had a disagreement because he had uh, a vision that he said that PayPal should be more of a bank. It should be doing everything that a bank does uh, beyond just what it is now, email-based payment system. But yeah, the experience he has is fantastic there. What's your thoughts as the world moves to subscription model? I have a belief, uh, a lot of us do, that Tesla is going to move to subscription. They just recently announced a financing arm, uh, financing uh, offer for you know Model S, Model X, where it's now three point nine nine percent. 
And then, of course, their insurance, uh, their subscription for the supercharger, the FSD, entertainment. You can kind of start seeing that if they can get to a monthly payment model, um, that that's the future and they can kind of make it easier to uh, you know, afford a very, very expensive car. Um, any thoughts on Tesla financing or, I don't know, supercharging uh, payment systems or how that might all come together? Well, I, I mean... You know, it's very clear between Tesla, SpaceX, like Elon certainly embraces a very vertically integrated approach. Um, yeah. I mean, right down to some really like uh, individual components. I mean, does not like dependencies on third parties. And as a result, I mean, has phenomenal margins, a great control over his product experience. He's able to execute really, really fast. Um, I mean, so much so that like, you know, you can, you can throw away rockets because by the time they, they're off the assembly line, the prior versions are already, you know, it's already obsolete and he's got the improved version behind it. I mean, um, it's a great setup if you, if, if you can have it. So um, it's not shocking at all to bring financing in-house. Um, I, I think there's a ton of service opportunities. It seems obvious. I mean, right, like Apple, it was very obvious for a long time. And I feel like analysts only started to pay attention to it in the last couple of years, but it's like, if you think they're just a hardware company, like you're, you're really mistaken. Right. And, um, and I think that like the visibility of that into, you know, Tesla's trajectory is pretty obvious as well. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so I want to continue with the, the shift floor a bit more. So you've expanded, you're going global. Um, and then, uh, you're, you're just trying to accelerate that. And then you're, you got your partnership with, uh, Starlink. Any kind of then what's the next stage? What's the future of uh, Shift Four? What's your mission? What's your uh, kind of like your dreams of where that's going to go? Just going to continue to grow, um, continue to make things easier for consumers. Is there a, are you the kind of people? Are you innovating any areas that, that uh, uh, I think there was a, a, a what is that that slide on your investors deck? That's something like uh, I can't remember what you called it, but something like magical technology or something like that. <laughs> I mean, where are our vision is to, you know, power the world through connected commerce. Um, but I will say like relative to like reducing the, the world's, you know, dependency on, uh, on fossil fuels or, um, making life multi-planetary, it's, you know, it's, it's probably not the most sexy of, uh, uh, of visions. Um, but look, we're, we enjoy what we do, right? Um, like we take a lot of, a uh, lot of satisfaction in, in being behind the scenes of some amazing experiences. Like, all the best theme parks in the country, including like the, the biggest one you would know, um, uses Shift 4 payment technology. All like the, the coolest hotels and restaurants and the stadiums you would take your kids to, to you know, to, 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 see, um, to see a football game or soccer game, baseball game or something like that. Like um, these are our customers. Um, and it's pretty cool to know that we can make that whole like commerce experience happen. And we just want to do that in, in more verticals and in more geographic locations around the world. Um, uh, and like I said, I mean, like we're pretty grounded. Like it's this isn't world changing stuff like Tesla and SpaceX and St. Jude. They're doing some really world changing things. But we, we do have a culture of winning. Um, you know, it's uh, from our world. So it's, uh, it's about being boldly forward. It's not being afraid to, like, you know, break glass to get things done um, and to do it in kind of like a smart, disciplined way. And, and we get a lot of satisfaction in winning. So, like I said, for 23 years, we, we've been confined to, you know, the U.S., which is a fantastic market. But now we're being unleashed globally and we're following a pretty incredible organization around the world to do it. So so that gets me excited. And, you know, personally, like I'm I'm, I'm thrilled to still being able to still to be able to keep doing this after 23 years, like to, to wake yeah. up and be motivated at Chip 4 and to be connected to other organizations. Like I'm incredibly lucky to be a fly on the wall and watch the history that SpaceX is making, um, you know, with, with, uh, commercial space flight, like we're, we're doing with, uh, inspiration Four and the players program thrilled to be able to support St. Jude and their important vision. Um, so I'm like, just really lucky with all these great organizations I'm connected to. Yeah. So you're shift Four invested in SpaceX and then, uh, you know, you're, you're amazing as a person, of course, you've gone from founding this company, making sure that it's successful, growing it like you are. But then you're also an astronaut, a pilot, uh, like we talked about a philanthropist. But, uh, you know, you, your, your interest in space, was that, again, when you're in high school, did you ever imagine that you're going to be an astronaut? Um, and then how did that all come together? Because, again, it's just your willingness to strike out and, uh, you know, to, to just be bold and try something new, right? Or is it something you've always had and knew that you're going to do? 
I, I mean, I wanted to be an astronaut since kindergarten. I mean, <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I, I became a pilot because I thought that that's as good as it's going to get. And yeah. I love the challenge of it. It became therapy for me because I mean, for a long time, I mean, until I had kids, all I did was work. Um, you know, you fall asleep yeah. on the keyboard, you wake up and you keep going. Uh, so flying became like a great challenge. Um, you know, a way to decompress before, you know, getting back at it. And then, it, it, I mean, it, it not only became like a, a hobby, a passion, um, you know, flew air shows and such, but became a business. I created, you know, I was co-founder yes. of Defense Aerospace Company for and CEO of that for 10 years and sold that business. And, and that I considered some of the most, what well, was, you know, it's some really demanding and fun flying. But I, I, I even long before I even was involved with SpaceX, I remember, you know, at our, our holiday party saying, look, you know, and in terms of where you guys can go to work every day, like number one is 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 SpaceX commercial space industry. Number two is being Top Gun every day, and that's what we do. Yeah. That's a pretty good place to be. Um, but yeah, I um, uh, I was lucky that it ultimately uh, was able to parlay that into into commercial space. And I, I mean, from my perspective, you know, um, it's it's hard to imagine where you could make a bigger a bigger impact than helping open up. Um, you know, access to, to space for the many and maybe set help at least in a very small way, contribute on a course that could unlock some of, you know, the secrets of the universe and why we're all here. So it's, um, yeah, it's mm -hmm. pretty awesome. I've part. heard you, uh, explain a little bit, but I'd love you to do that again for me and the audience here about how you see, why you see, uh, the technology and the, uh, investments in space matter to the folks that uh, live here on earth. Uh, I think you've done it that you've explained that in quite a nice, um, specific way that I really liked. Yeah. Well, I mean, similar to what Elon has said, I, I a hundred percent, I believe like the vast majority of, of our resources here on earth have to be spent towards making our planet a better place and trying to solve some of the hardships that, you know, plague life for so many, but those hardships have existed for thousands of years. Um, it doesn't mean you hit the pause button on progress. Um, you know, look, it, it, there's definitely, you know, like really bad things that can still happen in the world. But look at the life expectancy rate of, of people, even even across third world countries over the last, you know, 100 years. Progress has helped, you know, elevate, um, you know, uh, like, you know, life for, for, for many people. So the point is you have to do both, right? Um, and the investments that we are making, you know, in, uh, in humans, in human spaceflight have like a real impact back here on earth. Starlink is one of the best examples of it. I know I mentioned it before, but yeah. you know, you're not running fiber lines, uh, you know, across, uh, deserts and rainforests, you know, but, uh, but a vertically integrated launch and satellite provider can put connectivity above you. Um, and that connectivity, you know, could change everything. Um, I think there was like a, you know, it's a Navy SEAL said a while ago, like, how would you deal with the the problem in North Korea? And he said, I would just drop a couple hundred iPhones in over the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like amazing, like what access to information and connectivity can do to, you know, change a, and, you know, a course in life. Um, and, and the St. Jude example is, is certainly one of them, uh, you know, telemedicine to those that didn't even know that, um, you know, they might need the help of St. Jude, but there's so many others. I mean, you know, you, you really go across the spectrum of the real challenges uh, to, you know, humanity um, and connectivity can solve a lot of it. And, and, and look at how it came to be, right? It's, it's reusable rockets that can put people in space, but they can put satellites like Starlink in space too. Um, and then from yeah. like a bigger picture perspective, if you really, if you really love earth and, and humankind and, um, you know, and want the existence of our species, then we have to branch out beyond earth. We weren't meant to just stay here. Um, didn't work out well for the dinosaurs. And now we actually have, you know, the technological means to explore our solar system. We got other things we got to solve like physiological and psychological, but we have the technical means to do it now. Thanks to the work that SpaceX has done. It's pretty awesome. Wonderful. So with Inspiration4, that was the first all-civilian space flight that you commanded. Uh, wonderful, wonderful effort. Uh, you went into space, into orbit, and you stayed for three days. You raised, uh, like we said, uh, $250 million for St. Jude. Wonderful story. Now you're going to come back and you've got this Polaris program, three more uh, flights. Uh, what's your goal? What's going to happen? And uh, tell us about, uh, you know, how, how do you stop inspiration for? That was pretty awesome. 
Well, my concern of being able to top Inspiration4 is why I almost didn't come back to it. I, I thought we set the bar really high and didn't want to do yes. anything to take away from um, you know, what we achieved with Inspiration4. But there, there's more work to be done for sure. The, the end goal of the Polaris program is, is you have a, a crewed operational Starship. I mean, that's our last mission. will be the first crewed flight of Starship. And that's so important. Yes. Um, fully reusable first and second stage will materially drop the cost, uh, drop, you know, the cost to access orbit. Um, and that's not just for people, right? I mean, I, I've used this example before, but if you go back to the 80s and you think about who had car phones, like these obnoxious Wall Street types, right? Um, but who would think that, you know, fast forward, you know, 20, 30 years, the most valuable companies, you know, some of the most valuable companies in the world are the, are the companies that make software for those phones, the apps that live inside the, the infrastructure, right? You just don't know how much it's going to, you know, change the course of, of humanity with some of these like major evolutionary breakthroughs. Um, that's what Starship will do. Like we don't even know the applications that could be that could happen in low Earth orbit because it's still very costly. But when it drops to like the level that Starship can do it, you could have who knows biotech, three D printing organs in space, mining. Like we don't know what like new sources of energy we could discover. So it's um so it's pretty awesome. So we got to get that going, and that's the final mission. And and if we do that, then you have the hopefully the DC three or the seven thirty seven of human spaceflight. But beforehand, there's a lot to learn. So the first Polaris mission, Polaris Dawn, which will launch later this year, um, has three big objectives. First, um, it'll be the highest Earth orbit ever flown. So we'll go farther away from Earth than uh, anyone has gone since Apollo 17, 50 years ago, um, right to the Van Allen radiation belt, where um, being in that high radiation environment, we're going to learn a lot about vehicle architecture design. So, you know, in the past, mm -hmm. thinking is you need to have a lot of radiation hardening. That, that's a lot of mass. Um, and then obviously the impact on the human body, because if you're going to the moon or Mars, you're going through the Van Allen belts. And if you're in space for a really long time, you're going to get, you know, constantly peppered with, with, um, you know, cosmic background radiation. So we can learn a lot there. Then we're going to come down in altitude and we're going to do a spacewalk. So we're going to vent the entire dragon capsule down to vacuum. And we're going to come out of the vehicle with a brand new EVA suit. And why does this matter? Because there's like 10 EVA spacesuits at NASA right now. That's like all that exists in this hemisphere. And, uh, and they, they literally cost like a billion dollars. Like it's hundreds of millions of dollars <laughs> every year in maintenance because they have to fly them up and down on rockets. Now, right. if you believe as SpaceX does that you're going to populate Mars someday, well, spacesuits can't cost hundreds of millions. So you have to figure out a way to mass produce low cost, reliable suits, and then figure out a way to, you know, exit your vehicle or habitat and do work in them. Um, and, uh, and that's what we kind of are endeavoring to, to accomplish with our, our second objective, which is test out a brand new EVA spacesuit that will not cost hundreds of millions of dollars, learn the operations around it, the whole pre-breathe to avoid decompression sickness. Um, and then our third objective will be testing a, a new communication network over Starlink's laser-based communication between wow. two objects traveling 17,500 miles an hour. Um, and this is important because, um, what you know, as space opens up for everyone, the infrastructure to support those people or even those satellites or, the, you know, um, that payload is not uh, capable of, of supporting it. Like, give you an example. When Inspiration4 was on orbit, um, we only had communication coverage about 80 percent of the time over three days, which was not a, a super big deal. But what happens when you have hundreds or thousands in orbit? You're relying on like five or six old TDRS satellites that are like 30 years old. Um, so we're going to, we're going to test communicating over Starlink and, and that should be the, the path of communication to the moon and Mars someday. And, and we'll be up for five days. So lots of science and research, uh, can be done. Um, and then we'll work on Polaris too, which will be the next mission. That is so exciting, Jared. <laughs> You're so exciting. Uh, I love, I think I've heard you say before that one of the real benefits of what you're doing is helping SpaceX achieve reusable rockets. And when they are able to do reusable rockets, it just dramatically reduces the cost of getting to space. And so what are the benefits of that for people on Earth? One of the examples I think I've heard you say is that, well, right now, the only satellites that they are able to put up there are those that are funded by very large corporations, um, large entities and huge budgets. But if you're able to bring up more satellites, more specific satellites, perhaps they can you know, understand the climate uh, better and weather better 
because they're they're able to get you know it's it's like it just when you dramatically reduce the cost you can have a lot of different uh, use cases that now become available can you give other examples of what that might be yeah i mean this speaks to why spacex is such an incredible organization right i mean they pioneered reusable rocket technology um i mean they landed a rocket on a ship in 2015 Nobody else has done it once. They've done it over a hundred times. And you never see this before, by the way, in, in tech companies. Like somebody has a breakthrough, like here's my iPhone. Right. All right, the uh, whatever, the, the Galaxy is six months behind. It's never like eight years later and I'm still trying to figure it out, right? So that really speaks to the lead that SpaceX has. But thank goodness for it, because without reusable rockets, there is no inspiration for, you know, there's no Polaris program, like only the US, Russia, and China. That's it have put human beings in orbit with their own rocket technology. That's how damn expensive it is that you got to be a world superpower to do it. Now we have commercial missions, right? So that credit, I mean, they certainly SpaceX benefits from 60 years of NASA, you know, lessons learned and stuff. But SpaceX really kicked down the door, broke the mold, pioneered a, a critical capability. Now it helps getting humans in space, but it helps putting all sorts of objects in space too. And, and to your point, Prior to SpaceX, you want to put a satellite up. It's a it's a quarter of a billion dollars, right? So how much how much like how much failure can you accept in that environment? Um, you got to get it right. If there's ten good ideas for a satellite, you got to pick the best one, the sure thing, right? But now with reusable rockets that are launching, you know, basically every four or five days, you can you can book a very small portion of a rocket as part of the rideshare mission missions and test something out, see if it works. Right. And it's like we can fail in this environment. Maybe we'll learn something. Maybe this satellite idea that wasn't a good idea at a quarter of a billion dollars could teach us something that's important. Um, and that's why I'm saying like that's what, that's what we have today. Imagine with Starship. That's going to bring it down even more like a material reduction in cost from even what SpaceX has done with Falcon. Um, it's why this is this is an Starship is such an evolutionary leap. Yeah. I'm so excited with what you're doing and uh, can't wait till we do your Polaris programs where we just keep learning and, and getting around and we just keep going one step forward. Eventually, there'll be a base on the moon um, and just so much more knowledge uh, and and just we'll learn more about the galaxy. So this is stuff that you're doing. I, I You really have inspired a lot of people, including myself, of course, with both your business endeavors and then your philanthropy. Uh, you're pretty modest about all the things you've done there, um, which is something that, uh, I, you know, I, again, just I'm glad that you're doing because you've benefited from, you know, your entrepreneurship, giving back to the world, but you yourself are enjoying your life. <laughs> you're doing, you're, you're hitting your mission. Uh, can you believe it? I mean, you're out there. You are an astronaut and uh, soon you'll be what, what, even more experienced than maybe just a handful of people. Because once you keep going up there and you're commander of all these uh, space flights, so you're leading the charge for humanity. Um, of course, like we said, it's Elon and SpaceX, but uh, you have your big part to play. So thank you for all of that. I'm super lucky and I'm just, just trying to maximize the opportunities that I've been lucky enough to get. Um, and along the way, try and leave things a little better. So that's the goal. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jared, for your time. Um, you know, there's so many things that you said today that uh, I have to also review and think through decision making. But the, um, the you know, first principle thinking, the the way that you look at your decisions and how you created the company um, and how you the things you've learned by looking closely to one of the best companies in the world, SpaceX, how they're doing it and how you're applying it. So thank you so much, Jared. Um, everyone, you know, follow Jared on Twitter. His handle is at Rook Isaacman. Shift4 is a public company. The stock sticker is 4, F-O-U-R. And of course, you can check out their website. So hopefully you learned something new. Thank you, everybody. And thanks again, Jared. This is uh, was very, very good. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for having me. I'm glad I ran into you at the, uh, at the Broadway show. <laughs> uh, this is the way the world works, I think. Fate loves irony or something like that. But thank you so much. All right. Take care.